So we've had lots of discussions around the idea of a sensory apparatus. Now, obviously, given our three backgrounds, we've all got kind of different perspectives on this. I'm, I'm always wearing my science hat, of course, so I'm going to take that stance tonight somewhat, but we'll he be hearing about more sort of subjective ideas shortly. Now, to me, a sensitive or a sensory apparatus is really a sensitive measuring device. So it's something that we can use to measure try to objectively measure phenomena in the world out there. So this could be, for instance, a thermometer or some sort of solar panel or something that we can pick up something in the atmosphere or something out there. And it can capture an instant moment in time or it can be continuous. So the words capture, monitor, continuous can be quite important to this discussion. I'm particularly interested in ideas around observation, and we'll get to why I'm interested in that shortly, but of course, for those of you who know anything about quantum physics, observation is one of the sort of strange and unusual aspects in there. One of the things that I'm quite interested in, and what um, we'll be looking at in the project, um, is how there is this movement to try and capture some of these more an intangible things like relationships and like emotions through algorithms and that you can kind of start to have this idea that you can start to have these apparatuses that can sense emotions and moods and it's something that is a, in play in politics when you start to have uh, governments looking at trends in kind of how the population is feeling and then baselining decisions off that and algorithms um, that start to kind of look at how relationships work. You can start to see the empirical, the scientific, the kind of like physical way mm. of that you can sense, and you can also start to see these kind of like more intangible ways that you can start to sense emotions and um, all of these things that up to date have been quite difficult to measure on, on such a large scale. I'm just going to speak a little bit about how traditionally we think about um, quantum physics being a very, well it is a very modern contemporary mode of science it's kind of it was a massive paradigm shift to kind of move from the classical Newtonian science into quantum physics but in terms of when you start to make analogies with photography actually I'm I'm beginning to convince myself that classical more 20th century analog photography is more like quantum physics and the classical physics is more like the digital images that are in flux and so on and this is what I'm going to just dig out now. Now let's think of the act of observation because this is what we're getting down to. We're talking about measurement, observing, apparatus, data collection. So how can we observe this quantum superposition? Is it possible? There's glasses in many locations at the same time if it was a quantum particle but how, how come we don't see this glass smearing out in space in front of us now? If scientists observe a quantum particle, so you interact with it using light, so you may, might shine a laser beam onto this particle, then randomly it will choose to localise in one location and it stays there fixed. Okay? And people don't quite understand why this happens, but we know that it happens. And this is why we don't ob observe quantum superpositions in the world around us. Okay, so I wanted to talk about something called quantum Zeno effect, which essentially is what I've just mentioned here. So you can encourage this glass to swish around in the quantum realm. So imagine it's shifting from one location to another to another, and at some points in time it will be in a superposition of many locations. But if you observe it continuously with a laser beam and you watch it directly at this location, then it will remain fixed there. So the act of observation is fixing reality, the state of reality. If you remove that laser beam, then it can start to move around in this quantum superposition again. But essentially, as this is where the parallels with classical photography comes in. You're using light, and you're really, through the act of observation, you're fixing this. It might not be that we're observing the light, but if the light, if you're using a laser beam to watch this atom or this glass, it will stay fixed. As a project evolves, we're thinking about the modes of capture, <coughs> what sort of data or light and ob observation we can capture in the gallery space. So what sort of invisible or intangible, and the visible as well, but can we capture and how can then 
how can we then represent this? And this led me to think of ideas and to make analogies between the quantum Zeno effect, so this act of observation, freezing reality while you're looking, and also Jeremy Bentham's and Foucault's Panopticon model of the prism. So we're, we're diverging, but this will lead yeah. into Anna's discussion shortly. So for those of you who don't know, there's Foucault discussed in his book Discipline and Punishment, Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon model of a prison. I'm going to take, he discusses in it at discusses it in a wider context, but I'm going to literally discuss the actual architecture of this space and how it really is very quite similar to the quantum Zeno effect in terms of it modifying the behavior of reality, but the behavior now is actually the inmates in this prison. So the model of this prison allows for inmates to be observed continuously, and even like with the quantum Zeno effect, even if you're not observing them directly, but maybe you're looking someone else, you still modify their behavior. So you're changing the state of reality, which is people's behavior in the space. And it's well known that this model of the panopticon modifies behavior because it exerts this invisible power over the people, regardless of whether they're being, they know if they're being monitored or not. And, and this is where yeah, I'm passing over to Anna to talk well, more about. I think we it's a really nice metaphor for some of the stuff that is now happening in how people interact on the internet today um, because there's a big, big... I think it, what's interesting when you talk about data now is that there is a sense that data is a thing, it's an object, it's being talked about all the time, it gets sold, it gets bought, it's a currency, but what that ignores is the fact that data collection is in fact a process and that there is a big gap I think um, and this is something that we're trying to explore between um, those who collect data be it government be it companies be it hackers and those who are being collected from and I think there's something really nice as well that we're trying to unpack and that we'll, we might discuss later between um, leaking data which is something that you do on an unconscious level and um, data being hacked from you or being collected from you and harvested from you. The government has to act according to law. Companies don't necessarily need to. They act according to the terms and conditions of the privacy um, it waiver that you sign, but I'm pretty sure no one actually reads. So they have. there are all these different levels in terms of kind of like who can get your data, how it can be used, um, which can lead to some quite uncomfortable and interesting things. So you've got this you're at this point where you you're kind of like a giving all of the off this information and what i think uh, is really interesting is then how these different entities are using that to basically for their own benefit without your consent or knowledge because i think there is a big 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 gap between how pe what people are aware of they're doing in terms of the stuff that they're giving off, what their rights are, and then what different companies and governments are uh, using. We're leaving traces of ourselves all over the virtual world, really. Mm. So it's involuntary photographs of our lives being mm. scattered, and it will inevitably modify our behaviour. Yeah. So we've been discussing this a lot and been doing some tests, and ideally we would like to obviously capture data and so not just phot photograph people but we need to look at data leakage and what when people move through the gallery space what sort of data are they giving off so from my point of view I'm looking at the electromagnetic spectrum there's infrared information your phones are leaking just microwaves or radio waves and so on but then there's uh, intrinsic information content to these waves that Anna is yeah, hoping to so get I think as well what I'm hoping to get from it is a combination of what I mentioned before, what you leak normally, so the kind of stuff that you have open on the internet that is about you, and it is surprising what you can get. Because there's an interesting kind of like, I suppose, spectrum, which I kind of mentioned before, that you know, at the very, very, very top, you've got kind of like what people who, like what professional hackers do, you know, they can get into everywhere. Then you've got what corporations do, 
because mm. um, they're catching up with hackers. So we originally, when we put this project together, we were going to use a technique, but it's got patched, um, so we're having to use something else because stuff moves so rapidly in this space. But then, like in the panoptical model of a prison, how you have light coming through the cells and you can really observe a person, what we'd ideally like to do is project people's data back onto themselves so you can track them in the space and then guide your projector to project their information back on them so they're a walking embodiment of the information. So this is something we're working on currently. Yeah, but nice. yeah. I should be sure to come to your gallery with no Fitbit on, <laughs> no phone. I should just come naked.